Hi, I'm Arlene McIntyre, Creative Director at Ventura Design, and you're listening to Shut the Front Door, a light-hearted podcast that will bring you through the front door and into the homes of influential and interesting people. Home for me is one of the most important things in my life. My career has fortunately given me the opportunity to work closely with people and to help them create a home they will cherish forever. Today on Shut the Front Door, we are joined by one of the UK's foremost food writers, William Sitwell. William is a restaurant critic for The Telegraph, a broadcaster, author, and has been a regular judge on the BBC One's MasterChef for almost 20 years. He is the creator of one of the UK's best-known dining programs, William Sitwell's Supper Club, a firm favourite for lovers of great food. William also hosts a podcast called Biting Talk, where he talks to the biggest names in the business, as well as introducing new up-and-coming talent. With so many projects on the go, we are delighted William has taken the time to chat with us today. William, welcome to Shut the Front Door. So, William, thank you very, very much for joining me today. I hope you're keeping well. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you very much. Yeah, Touchwood, it's lovely to uh, speak to you. Thanks for having me on. And uh, where am I chatting with you from today? You, you mentioned you're in Somerset. Describe your location to me. Um, well, exactly. I am um, in our library that we that we created in this little farmhouse in West Somerset. Um, when we bought the house, this particular room um, was what I thought was a really ugly sort of conservatory slash family room, glass on all sides, which I thought was rather impractical. And so I shocked the builders when I said I actually wanted to block in about 80% of the windows, build shelves and build a library. So I'm sitting right in the middle of that, <laughs> surrounded by books, and there's still plenty of light, um, even on a slightly dreary day down here in uh, in the West Country. Um, we're just off Exmoor, so we're quite remote. We're not far from a beautiful little town called Wiverliscombe. So we have the Bristol Channel to our north and Minehead and the beaches of Dunster and Willacombe slightly further afield. Um, and we're about 20 minutes drive from Taunton so we can get into London. So, uh, yeah, I think we're in paradise at the moment, myself and my family. I've got quite a lot of – I've got four children here at the moment and um, my wife and a dog and and um, and, a, and, a, and a few hens and <laughs> quite a lot of pheasant that seem to be uh, out <laughs> in the garden and occasionally the odd sheep that seems to break through the um, the fencing on the other side of the orchard. So, uh, oh, yeah, wow. very happily uh, ensconced in uh, a room that my a, f- a friend of mine calls my word factory, the words factory. This is where words are made. Words, words are created wow. for money. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Gosh, you've described it so well, and it sounds fantastic. So you're good and comfortable. Well, William, I'd love to chat with you, if I may, about your first memories of growing up in home. Can you share some of those with me, please? Gosh, Um well, my very early childhood was spent in a little house on a street called Sussex Street in Pimlico, and um, which is not far from Victoria in London. That was where my parents first had a house. I was born in 1969 in London. And I don't think I have memories of that. I, I, I've seen my photograph in rather sort of smart looking pushchairs, um, rather elegant prams being wheeled around that part of um, London. Um, but I don't remember that specific part. We we moved, well, we moved quite often, actually. My father had a sort of propensity for buying properties and doing them up, and God bless him, he always tended to sell at the wrong time. <laughs> so he, he was a sort of <laughs> property dealer, but he didn't seem to make the money that property dealers made. I think he kind of got itchy feet and loved doing up wrecks. So I have very clear memories of living in um, Notting Hill, on a lovely house on Labrick Grove, um, not far from the police station um, and not far from Holland Park. And my early life was spent um, spent in London. And then I suppose in, when I was a kind of six, seven, eight, my mother got a cottage in Oxfordshire, a little thatch cottage in a tiny hamlet called Chilson, in a very pretty little valley uh, of the Evenlode little river. And we spent 
kind of happy weekends and summers. And I remember getting snowed in there in winter. It was um, very lovely, sort of old fashioned um, English childhood, really. Funnily enough, this part of Somerset reminds me of that because it's a bit like the world used to be back then. You know, we have a garage here that serves the community. We can get your car fixed. There's a little market in Wiverlisk and we go to on a Saturday. There's a wonderful butcher called Thorns that we shop in. It's just big enough to be useful, but not too, you know, we're far enough away from the ta- from the bigger town so people actually use it. You know, it's a foodie area, not for a, for fashion, but for need. But um, yeah, so my old my early till childhood really was Notting Hill and a bit of Oxfordshire before I was sent off to boarding school. <laughs> Okay, and what was that like going to boarding school? Can you share some of those memories with me? Well, I, I went to a place called Maidwell Hall in Northamptonshire. I was still seven years old when I was dispatched there. It wasn't something oh, I no. had a choice about. My, I had an elder brother, George, who was who was already there, so I wasn't sort of completely, you know, dumped on my own. Um, I have a very clear memory at the age of seven or eight of of the older boys who seemed to me to be like kind of giants and men who I found absolutely terrifying. And it, it amuses me now to think that those giants were literally about 11 years old. And um, it was a school that uh, it was a sort of big old country house that had been converted into a school. There was a wonderful man called Mr. Porch, who was our headmaster. He was a, a traditionalist to say the least. Um it was a it was a sort of extraordinary place, really. I mean, I was very happy there, and I still occasionally meet up with my old Maidwellian friends, and we sort of talk about the good old days. But some people might think it was a bit brutal. You know, it's funny because when I was about seventeen or eighteen, I suddenly realised why I used to always feel nervous at tea time, and this is something that went all the way through my teens. And it was because basically I was so used to being called down to the headmaster's study and flogged. <laughs> sort of being bad that that kind of it you know I was always a bit jittery I remember we'd sit in this big dining room and your name would be read out and you'd be ordered to come down and I remember you would us miscreant boys would be led down this dark passage down to what was called the private side which was a rather more airy and pretty and well-designed affair than the rest of the school and um we would line up outside the headmaster's study. And I remember there was a fireplace. There's never seemed to be a fire in it. But there were these little sort of enclaves either side of it. And into one, there were these two crimson slippers. And the head boy would walk from the study, where he'd obviously got a briefing from the headmaster, and he'd collect this pair of crimson slippers that he would then parade past you. And then you'd be summoned in, and you'd either be given a rather harsh slap on your bum with the crimson slip, or if oh. you were worse, you'd be caned. And I was caned a lot because I was lazy. I used to get very bad marks weekly, and so I was being I was always flogged for that. And we had the other sort of brutal bits, which I sort of sort of find funny is there was a sort of quite a vicious gang warfare that used to take place between the small boys who were called the squits and the older boys who were known as the squirts. And um, I remember the older boys, they had a den in the woods that was called the wilderness. And it was basically a hole in the ground covered with corrugated iron. And we'd occasionally be captured and dragged down there and kind of tortured. (laughs) And Oh, my Lord. I mean, the food was pretty horrible. I didn't eat anything. I was sort of stick thin. And um, the things we looked forward to were sort of chocolate biscuit cake. Well, if a boy had a birthday, you know, it was he was expected to basically produce a cake for the entire school. And at that point, I would probably eat something. Otherwise, I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't eat there. I didn't eat at home. I uh, wasn't really, ironically, what I do now. I had absolutely no interest in eating. I was rather, I was sort of thin and emaciated. Do you think that entire experience is what um, spurred on your passion for food? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, do you know, I also remember there was a man called Henry Flower who literally modelled himself on Hitler, same moustache, same haircut, and Lovely. he used to call himself Uncle Adolf. It was absolutely extraordinary. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, no, I mean, it, absolutely no foodie inspiration at all. Um, I ate very little at home as well. 
And um, I can remember kind of long afternoons when I was forced to sit in the dining room of our little cottage in Oxfordshire where I had to sort of sit there staring at bits of cabbage and carrots, which obviously didn't get any better for every moment they were left on the plate. And I knew that if I didn't eat them, I wouldn't be able to leave the room. But actually, I discovered that there was a corner cupboard, and if I could throw the vegetables at the top of that, then I could present the plate as being empty. <laughs> I mean, there must it must be a compost heap after a while, you know, the stuff growing there. But anyway, that was the way oh, right. I uh, existed. I like chocolate. I sort of lived on that. I used to make, I used to whisk up hot chocolate in the evening, and occasionally make chocolate Lovely. biscuit cake. That was about as good as mm. my culinary talents. So after all of that, William, do you still enjoy chocolate, or what? What did you take away from that experience? Uh, yeah, I still enjoy chocolate. It's taken me a lot of time to um, get around to enjoying cabbage, which I've always thought was the sort of you know, the devil's vegetable. Yeah. Um, but um, it, it it proved, no disrespect to my mother, that actually the way you cook stuff <laughs> does make quite a lot of difference. And the way that you chop carrots, um, yes. they really do taste better if you slice them long ways, sort of a la julienne, rather than just go dong, 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 all the way, you know, all the way down to turn into little sort of little roundels or whatever you call it, like this sort of I wonder of, why that is. Table. What, that's very I interesting. I don't know. It's, well, I think it's like so many things. It's, I suppose it's the, they're definitely sweeter mm-hmm. when they cook lengthways. They're definitely, I think also we tend to, regardless of the, the, the way stuff is cut, I think one tends to, well, certainly I do boil vegetables less these days. Yes. My mother has this belling, you know, she puts the veg in it. I mean, oh, my goodness me, you know, you can sit there for days and then, you know, she thinks it's still edible. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's certainly true that if you speak to a someone who's studied sashimi or su- someone who's, you know, a great Japanese chef, they will absolutely tell you that the way that you cut a f- piece of fish alters the texture and texture is such a key part of the experience of eating that it does in it does inform flavour. So I don't see why it, it shouldn't be the case as well for for veg. However, you cut something, prepare something, the love you put into something, you know, everything that informs the preparation of an ingredient um, improves its flavour, whether yes. it's in the mind or otherwise. You know, so I'm sure that if you know that someone or you believe that someone has spend a bit of love and care creating your carrot dish yes. you'll love it more than if you know it was just literally kind of chopped up in eight seconds and left to boil to death in boiling water where it probably lost all its flavor and and um, nutrition i think there's a there was actually a book written about that once many years ago like possibly 15 I'm, years ago, I'm I sure. remember coming across a book that was talking about the energy of the chef and their energy. If they've had a really bad day, you're going to taste that in the food. I think it's true. Great chef Mark Pierre White always says that um, cooking is an extension of someone's personality. And I think you can you can see it. I mean, if you know, uh, it all depends. It's it, again, if you know that someone has done it lovingly, it does taste better. In the same way that um, the asparagus that you grow in your own garden, you know it tastes better. Now, yes. it may not actually, but you still know that it does. And if you feel that something is better, then it's as good as being better. Mm. If you put your poacher poacher on while you go out into the garden. So the water is bubbling by the time you bring your asparagus in, um, you know, and it's that fresh, you know, it's going to be better. You know that if you make your own hollandaise, it's going to be better, even if it curdles. Yes. <laughs> you know, all these exactly. things, all these and things it, help. So yeah. I'm sure there's a book in it. Yeah, there is. I'm sure. And so when did your passion for food like officially begin? <laughs> God, I'm always worried about I'm sort of going to be busted here as a sort of complete <laughs> um, bullshitter um, who came rather late to the party because it's funny because in the kind of 20, 25 years that I've written about food, most people that I come across who are passionate foodies have this story where it doesn't matter if they were a food writer or critic or chef or restaurateur or passionate producer, passionate farmer, that they talk about. There they were at their mother's apron strings, 
desperate to get you know have a go cooking I'm afraid I can lay claim to sort of none of that partly as I've sort of already suggested that food was not particularly important in our house um if so if I'm completely honest it was really when I was offered a job as deputy editor of a magazine that was then called Waitrose Food Illustrated and this was in about 1999 mm-hmm. um and I hadn't heard of this magazine. Someone put me forward. I interviewed for it, got the job. I didn't quite know why I got the job. There was a slightly eccentric editor, rather wonderful woman called Katie Hillier, who interviewed me. And I remember she came around to my house, actually, a f- or flat in London. And she said, so tell me, what do you know about food? And I said, well, I eat. And I was going to expand on that. But she just sort of cut me off and talked to me for an hour and then offered me the job as her deputy. So I, as far as I know, I got, I got my first sort of big break into food journalism on the strength that I ate um, without any further explanation. So I must have said something that she sort of, maybe I'd tell some jokes or something. Anyway, um, she, uh, she got me on and then, so I was deputy editor of this magazine, as I said, that I have, to be honest, I hadn't really heard of. And then three years later, she left, I went for the job. And I remember actually, Specifically, unlike any other kind of moment in my life where I saw that there was there were two paths suddenly opening up. There was one path that basically said, if you go for this and you don't get it, you'll be the deputy who didn't get the editorship. And then what is it? An- another, you know, decades of rambling around as a sort of generalist, not really knowing what you want to do, which was sort of part of the story of my life. Um, or do you get this job and you get you become the editor and then you suddenly, you know, you're somewhere, you've got something. And I've never fought so hard for, for anything in my whole life. I did presentations, I pitched, I rehearsed, I thought deeply about it. Um, and I persuaded them, I think rather against the odds, because there were a lot, there were a lot of more senior people, uh, you know, much more experienced went for, who went for it. But I managed to get it. And thank God I did, because I had no idea what I'd be ended up, ending up doing now. So I was a journalist who ended up on a food magazine. That's amazing. And to me... Actually, food, as I realized then, particularly when I was trying to put together why I thought I was a good person for this, food, as someone who's interested in people and life and the peculiarities of life, and uh, I don't know, I sort of like to think that I can see the magic in anyone. There are no boring people in this world, that everyone's Mm -hmm. got something to talk about, even if they've got nothing to talk about. That's quite interesting. So... Food is this amazing keyhole, the door into culture. And food is about everything, isn't it? Because it's about entertaining. It's about poverty. It's about politics, culture. It's about history. It's about Mm. desperate need. It's about um, over-the-top greed. It touches everything. And whether you're part of a massive food culture enriched with cheese and wine and truffles or whether you're a brutalist survivor of communism food is still some somewhere in your soul and is important in some way so to me food is just this most amazing subject and for someone who's just alive with interest in the world and people i feel that i was i feel i was lucky i landed on something that i think i could you know i thought i could have a have a go at and it's really it's really interesting when you said cultural because it is really the first one of the first things you look for when you visit a country is yeah well yeah and more and more now you know we these days a lot of people travel for food um and i think we do that more than we ever did and, but as you say um you know you can look for the churches you can look for the art you can look for the beaches you can look for the food you can look for the drink I know, but you really, really look for forward that. to the food. So, like, even out, even if you're on a holiday and you're having your breakfast, you're wondering where you're going to eat dinner that night. It's kind of like all about the food. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned you mentioned breakfast. You know, holidays when you think about breakfast, isn't it? It's when you have the luxury, possibly, of someone else cooking your breakfast for you. Yeah, um, and time when you and can time enjoy to eat it. breakfast. Yeah, yeah, time to eat breakfast. Time to you know. Think of, I don't know, a little holiday in Greece where you've got that Greek yogurt, some honey and a little bit of fresh fresh fruit. Um, or you're in Japan and you have a sort of breakfast you'd never have conceived of, of sort of strange, um, eggy, 
yeah, and tofu and fish and sorts of things like that. So, yes. yeah, I mean, a bit of breakfast in India, dosas, masala dosas. I mean, it's mind blowing. Have you ever um, had breakfast so, in Germany? Do you know what? I don't think I've ever even been to Germany. I don't know why <laughs> I just haven't. <laughs> so the answer is no. Why well, I've not it's been a, to Germany? I must go to Germany. I'd love to go to should. Germany. You should. It's a very interesting kitchen. It's really interesting the cuisine there. Like they're big it's on not just dumplings. Breakfast. No, mm. <laughs> no. Um, sauerkraut's big. Obviously, um, they're big on dumplings. Um, they, you know, it depends on where you are in Germany. You know, they all have a specialty dish, like in Italy, but. Yeah, it's interesting. But, you know, it's heavy. They like their meats and their sausages. Mm. And they'll eat anything. That's the other thing. You know, like the Italians will eat pretty much anything. So um, that fascinates me, how they, they have no limits, really, for, to what they'll eat. Have you ever been to any of the markets in, in Tuscany or in Florence? I'm trying to think. Um I mean, I try and go to markets when I'm overseas. I always find it quite frustrating because if you haven't got a kitchen, it's just really annoying because you just go around looking at stuff. And I mean, I do love going to markets in wherever I am, whether it's in sort of Morocco or, you know, I love fish markets overseas, you know. And yes. um, I mean, I have to say, I think I've been to some of the most revolting markets in my life. Crawford <laughs> Market in... Um, Bombay in Mumbai is the revelation. If you oh, want no. to give up meat, it's worth looking at. <laughs> oh, no. You go into some sort of uh, Dante's uh, nightmare scenario of yeah. um, sort of haunches of, I don't know what it is, because they don't really kill beef, do they, out there? No. Cat cattle for beef. And you just see meat hanging up and other visions of you know crows sort of pecking on it oh geez louise that's just it's not good just just awful and i and i've always have tried to avoid meat in india and for good reason but the vegetable markets i mean oh when you when you go into that the there are sort of specific garlic markets in parts of crawford and when you see these mounds of garlic and it's all peeled it's just, it's just amazing. <laughs> it's just wow. like my idea of paradise. Yeah, oh God, you can get a whole bag of peeled garlic. But then you look at it and think, well, I'm in India. I'm staying in a hotel. I can't cook with this stuff. This is completely pointless. So I find markets frustrating because I'm not normally somewhere where I can cook. And I'm not yes. a cook because I generally talk about it. It's one of my great sort of uh, faults, really. I s- spend my life talking about food and I don't cook it enough, but I do love it when I do it. But the answer to your question is, uh, can I remember the markets of Tuscany? I can't think of one off off the top of my head right now, but I think I know what you mean. Yeah, they're pretty amazing, and and really, there's they have no limits to what they'll they'll experiment with or or try or it's amazing to me. And so, when did your you so you started cooking yourself? So when did your passion for cooking begin personally? Do you know if 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 my wife was listening to this, she would just be spluttering, and she would she would be asking, "When will your passion for cooking begin?" <laughs> um, occasionally, is on display at the weekend. I like cooking big pieces of beef. I slightly pride myself on doing it well. Mm. Um, smoking out the kitchen on the grill, and then um, I did a uh, a sort of bit of some rib the other weekend, and. Um, Cooked it for about three hours and very low temperature. It's absolutely beautiful, beautifully yeah. pink. So, um, I you know I I would never <laughs> I would if I said I had a passion for cooking. I just think people anyone who knows me would just laugh at me because they say, well, when are we going to see this? When are you going <laughs> to tear yourself away from your laptop where you write about it and actually do it? Um, yes. So I love to do it when I can. Um. But I think I would lie if I said I had more of a passion for cooking than I do of actually eating. And that's what I do most of the time. So I'm lucky because I can eat out and because I have to. Um, but uh, I've always enjoyed cooking. I love cooking on holiday. You know, I, I mean, you know, there's lovely self-catering holidays that you might have in Umbria or somewhere where you can actually go to the markets and buy the food and cook without recipes, just basically inspired by 
the freshness of the ingredients that that are you know that the unusual or beautiful looking aubergines tomatoes that actually taste of something that you get in greece or italy or spain room temperature fat juicy tasty unlike so much produce you get in this country yes which is just sort of about the color and the shape and not the flavor which is sort of depressing that's true so did you travel much in 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 you know when you were first you know entering the world of being a food writer did you did it take you you know on many different journeys around the world or where did you travel first yeah it did actually and also because over the years my boss andrew hirsch um one of the things that we did i wasn't just editing a magazine i was launching magazines in different countries and pitching to supermarkets and food brands and doing content for them, mainly magazines, uh, you know, other bits of digital as well. So, you know, I was editorial director of this company called John Brown for quite a few years. And so that was part of my job, traveling with my buddy, Andrew. And we would land in somewhere like Singapore or, um, uh, you know, Thailand or uh, Toronto, New York, and we'd go to these supermarkets and walk around them and suss them out and then pitch the next day. And so um, I have traveled a lot on business for food, but also I've sort of, because I was an editor, I sort of sent myself off on various journeys over the years. And in fact, I've got a column in the Telegraph called Hunter Gatherer, where between you and I, it's a great gig because particularly the last two years I've written that column. Obviously, we haven't been able to travel. Mm. So I've been able to do that economic thing that normally savages a travel writer, which is basically not write a travel column without needing to travel. And um, luckily, I've traveled quite extensively. So I was, I've been able to sort of dig deep for that column and right. think about the various experiences I've had over the years, whether it's um, treading the the grapes for port at Quinta de Naval in for the harvest in about 2008 or touring them the markets of uh, of melbourne uh or drinking wines in solden this amazing ski resort in austria um where they have this great wine festival every year called Weinanberg, where every year they have a different sort of conceit a different idea there was one year where all the best the world's best austrian winemakers all joined and if you haven't drunk Austrian wine and you haven't had really good Grüner Veltliner, then drinking it at high altitude and that acidity and that freshness and vibrancy of some of the best of Austrian winemakers like Bernard Ott yes. tastes very good up on a, on a, a, in a mountain. So I've been lucky enough, yeah, to, to travel quite extensively. And um, it's one of the things I've really, really missed uh, recently. And then the other thing that, you know, I miss the ease with which one could almost travel. Today, going overseas is just torture, you know, with all these documents and stuff. It's just a nightmare. And I get terrible sort of, well, plane fever, just the fear of missing flights. And, you know, I almost seem to muddle it somehow. I'm filling in the wrong passenger locator form or getting in some terrible pickle. Mm -hmm. So uh, I find the getting there these days uh, pretty miserable so I'm you know I'm sure life will ease and get better but um, hopefully right now I'm very happy to have memories of being to wonderful places that I can you know write about in the Telegraph sounds yeah that, that is that's interesting did you ever come across Anthony Bourdain in your in your time I met him once very briefly in London but I can't say we really had a conversation yes um, you know I've always admired him I love the his sort of fluency in of mm -hmm. language and description. I never quite believed that he was, you know, quite the sort of tough nut that he made out, but he certainly made a great living out of it. Uh, or the idea of, you know, Hell's Kitchen, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, it was so shocking when he died because there was a guy you thought was just so full of life and experience. And it really rattles you when you discover that someone's, you know, riven with anxiety, someone even as successful and rounded and and interesting and uh, and challenging intellectually and so on as he was, 
So um, uh, briefly, yeah, but I can't pretend any more than that. Yes. And so, William, you recently sold the phenomenal Western Hall. Can you talk us through what it was like living in such a historical building? Well, this was a house that had been in my family since 1714 through more or less direct descent from a woman called Susanna Jennings who came to live in what was a rather smaller house after she'd lost her husband um, in the early 1700s. And it's in in a very quiet patch of Northamptonshire, what they used to call the Lost Villages, but more or less right in the centre of England. I mean, if you literally put a cross through England, you know, you get to a sort of Daventry and just a little bit far south of that was Weston. And in fact, there was a beautiful tall beech tree on the south front of the garden of the house that my great-grandfather, uh, an, an extraordinary eccentric man called Sir George Sitwell, he said that that uh, tree marked the centre of England, which I like the idea of. It's absolute nonsense, but actually but he wasn't far off it. Um, so this is a house that... Um, I knew all my life. I used to go there in the kind of, you know, early 70s when my grandparents, my grandfather, who was a great writer called Sir Chevrolet Sitwell and his his wife, Georgia, my Canadian grandmother, had a sort of gravelly voice, Canadian accent, and I always found rather terrifying. I used to go there, you know, and it was sort of, the drawing room was not for little boys. It had a lots of trinkets at eye level and you were not to touch them. And the house strangely went through the female line of the family through death or accident for several centuries until my great-grandfather acquired it from an aunt, was going to sell it, and he spent three long winter months in about 1910 sifting through the contents, and she'd left him enough money to actually sell the contents and get them all moved and you know order the vans to come and collect them. But he was so riveted by the place that he decided not to sell it, and instead... Um, it, it went to my uh, grandfather, Sir Chevrolet, and he lived there from the kind of 19 teens uh, onwards till he died there in 1988. Yeah. And so it was a sort of centre of life of the, of the 20s and 30s of the most extraordinary people in the literary scene um, from Evelyn War, Siegfried Sassoon, Noel Coward all stayed there. The Visitor's Book is this sort of amazing artefact of of um, literary history, the names in it. And I spent, you know, from our, we moved there after my, well, after my grandmother died in 1980, and we as a family and my parents and my brother and sister moved there. So this was sort of, you know, in the kind of early 80s. And, you know, we all, you know, it felt like a sort of huge place. It was, you know, it's not, it wasn't a stately home. It wasn't sort of architecturally magnificent. It was a, what you might call a kind of medium-sized manor house enlarged by the family as it had sort of grown richer in the 19th century. So that what was once a smaller house with a pretty courtyard then had that courtyard covered in to make a smarter drawing room. But I remember it as a room, as a house of some sort of 60-odd rooms. I remember discovering a room I didn't even know existed off one of the attics, a whole floor of rambling attics, but a house where every room was a sort of time capsule of a particular time in English social history. The library, of which, thank God, I sit in a room with some remnants of those books, was the, the most special room I can conceive of. Uh, a lovely dark green room with gilded edges of, edges of shelves and wow. and case after bookcase after bookcase of old leather-bound books. And this wonderful quiet room, always shaded on a, you know, warm enough on a cold day, lovely and cool on a hot day. Mm-hmm. I mean, Weston was a freezing cold house, to be honest. It was perfect in the summer. In the winter, it was fairly miserable. There were always um, howling drafts. You know, you could, you could sort of sit in the drawing room and see the carpet rippling, you know, with with the wind. Um but I don't remember being cold there when I grew up. I remember the idea of how wonderful it was to literally lose yourself in the attics and pour over ancient books and mm-hmm. folios. And I remember finding my father's reports, actually, which were even worse than mine. It just cheered me up. 
So it's this beautiful house, but we came to the conclusion that it just wasn't viable anymore. We, we, we faced a thing called the decennial tax, which because of the, the structure of the house financially, we faced paying a 6% charge every 10 years just to live in it. And, you know, that was a lot of money given its value. And um, I did all I could. You know, I had I did Airbnb. I did, I did my supper club there. But then the insurers decided to reward my efforts by trebling the insurance premium to cover public liability. So I said, look, sod this, put up the white flag. And we, we sold it this year, earlier this year. It was very, very sad because it was a place that was, I mean, I know how privileged we were to live in it and I feel so happy and lucky that I did live in it. But yes. um, uh, it was it was horrible to see go. So we had the content sale not long ago at Druitt's, an amazing auction house. And that was kind of weird <laughs> when you see all your family clobber dressed, uh, dressing different you know rooms of, of an auction house in different lots. Um, but fortunately, my brother, sister, and I, we swiped a few books in the old picture. And where I'm sitting now, I'm surrounded actually by a few things from Western, which makes me happy. Oh, that's sweet. And can you remember your very last time to walk through the house? Oh my God, I remember it like yesterday. It was, I mean, it, this was only sort of the end of March. It was a Friday of this year, 2021. And um, I'd spent the whole week trying to pack up as much as I could. We had a team in the house packing. I naively thought that, you know, the house could be packed up with, you know, fairly easily in a couple of weeks. And Druitz, who organized it, um, gave us this team of people. There were about 10 of them. And the week began. They were absolutely brilliant. Um, and at the beginning of the week, you know, we'd sit there in the drawing room having drinks. And by the end of the week, the beds that they were sleeping on had gone. They were sleeping on blow-up mattresses. We were drinking the remnants of the cellar on deck chairs in the drawing room, denuded of furniture and paintings. And the house just slowly emptied um, in that week. It was very, very odd. I had the sort of that same sensation you have, you know, at a kind of family funeral where you're very distressed, but there's a sort of weird feeling of exhilaration. Do you know there's a sort of... Yes. You know, I suppose you get... Uh, the body kind of pumps blood around to keep you going and you kind of get a weird yeah, sort of that, high. I don't, do you know, it's odd. Yes, it's like a bittersweet kind of feeling. Yeah, it was It was sort of weirdly exciting and horribly mm-hmm. depressing at the same time. And the last day I was up in what was called the book room, sort of sifting through books, just thinking I can't take anything more. I'd opened a cupboard earlier in that day in, in the second kitchen. I sort of faced with more shells of stuff I hadn't disposed of or remembered and some friends of mine came over because I'd said look take as many books as you like and one friend of mine um, brought a horse box and he filled it with books for his two children so that you know their houses in London now have every bookshelf is stuffed full and other friends of mine came and took books and then one of them said you know you okay and I kind of fell to pieces to be honest Mm -hmm. and I took one more walk around the garden and drove off and uh, and um, said said goodbye to the place. You know, anyone selling an old family house will will, will know the feeling. My do mother's still there in the gardener's cottage. Actually, I don't know how she can do it. I'd have a telescope, you know, <laughs> spying on what the, <laughs> what the new owners were doing. I had strange dreams of going back in the house. You should, you know, and then the, and then you own the, the, uh, the my dream. I have this dream where I would go back in the house and they've knocked all the walls through and they've. Turned it into some sort of gothic banqueting hall with oh no bling bonquettes and it's just weird. <laughs> but I'm sure they well they can't do it because it's listed. <laughs> but no, I shan't go back. But I I I I I'm, I know that I know every inch of that house and that's a memory. It's funny, you know. I can still walk around my prep school. I can still walk through the corridors and the passages of a place I left in about 1982 or something. Um, and I think I'll be able to walk through Western and open the cupboards and the doors. And, you know, I know that yes. the different sounds of locks, the different creaks mm-hmm. um, of doors. And and uh, I find that very comforting, that memory. Yeah. You know, the house could burn down, could dissolve, but that memory will always be absolutely. just absolutely burning in my mind. And I'm, it, I feel very lucky to have that. Yeah. 
And it'll always come into your dreams. Like, that's really interesting. I, to this day, still have dreams about walking through my school or walking through my childhood home. I'm still in that home all the time, like 30 years later. It's crazy how that happens. But it's so vivid and real. It's lovely. Yeah. It's yeah. great, isn't it? Yep. Yes, it is. It's amazing. It's like those dreams. You you know, I sometimes dream about my father and we chat and I, it's very odd. And what the, what the subconscious does is so clever. I can wake up feeling I've seen him. You know, yep. he died in about 2002. It's incredible. You know, you suddenly have this vivid memory. You hear his voice in your dreams. Yeah. So thank God for that little bit of insanity in us. It actually keeps us in, keeps us sane. You know, we just, I don't think we know half of it or what's happening to us in those moments. You know, yeah. you just don't know because you can wake up and really believe that that happened. And it's, it's, it's mm. comforting actually as well. So yeah, can be bittersweet for sure. And so your current home that you're living in now, is that a historical property or did you move somewhere more contemporary? Um, it's not historical. I mean, I don't know how old it is. It's been added on over the years. It's sort of slightly rambling farmhouse. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, it's, I, I, it's, I think it's very pretty inside. You know, we've made some really lovely rooms. Yes. Um, but uh, I don't think there's any, <laughs> any historical interest to okay. it at all. <laughs> But it's just a lovely spot. Yeah, great. And you've got four kids, gosh, so you, you've got a busy household. Yeah, I feel very privileged that um, the two older ones are here. Um, my eldest daughter is a brilliant student up at Edinburgh. My yeah. son, Albert, is a is a great tennis player. He's now, I think it's about, about 442nd best player in the country of all men as a 17-year-old. Yeah. And I find that a phenomenal achievement. So he's a... He's a great tennis playing talent, and I'm very proud of those two children. And then I've got two little ones, Walter, who I feel slightly less proud of, given his behaviour at lunchtime, <laughs> and, uh, and Barney, who's one. So they were, they're all, uh, yeah, my little two blonde boys who are a complete delight Aww. and uh, keep me on my toes and uh, stop you drinking too much at night because you've got to get up in the morning and get them up. Oh, yeah, totally, you know? yeah. It's a, it's a great kind of way, I think, of uh, uh, warding off alcoholism and eating too much and drinking too much, knowing you've got to get up. The, yeah. the alarm will go at 6.30, 7 o'clock, and you've got to get the kids out of bed. That and my Peloton keep me sane. <laughs> oh, my God. The Peloton. Tell me about that. Oh, so there's this guy called Alex Toussaint. Mm -hmm. He's my he's my virtual instructor. <laughs> and, um, if people don't, people, I, I was really, the the Daily Mail have a sort of contemptuous way of describing, I think, civil servants who have pelotons working from home as if it's some sort of ridiculously loose thing. All I know is that it's the most brilliant uh, thing that keeps me sane. I have this little shed and the peloton sits in it. And for people who don't know, when you heard about it, what it is, it's basically, it's a bicycle, but uh, there's you, it's like a sort of, you do a studio workout mm -hmm. and you can either join the instructor live or you can watch them on demand. And some of them are very, very inspiring. So there's this 29 year old guy called Alex Toussaint. I think he's in New York. I don't know where he is. Actually, he could be LA. And, um, I try and hop on my bike about three or four times a week and he Excellent. kind of kicks, kicks my ass. And I don't think I've ever done a live class, but you get what's called a live leaderboard. So there's other people who join you in the same session and you can compete against them. And uh, you sweat like hell and uh, it's absolutely amazing. So I do kind of, short as is 20 minutes, I might do a 45 minute cycle, it really gets the heart pumping. It's slightly addictive. But it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, I know people might go, well, isn't it tragic? You should be cycling around the beautiful Somerset Hills. Well, it's pitch dark in the evening now and I'll probably get run over. And this, <laughs> the hill's almost too steep, actually. Whereas the Peloton, you know, I jump into my little world. Yes. Um, get my ass kicked by Mr. Tucson. I'm assuming that you haven't watched the new Sex in the City that's come out series. That's no, but you know what? I mean, I've read about this and the idea that the Peloton... <laughs> share price has dived because someone had a heart attack you know come on 
Mr. Big. And it, it appears that, it, you know, the Peloton might have actually killed him. We, we, we're not yeah. sure if it was that or the cigars well, or the red I wine. Sometimes, but- I sometimes worry that I've pushed it, you know, when I'm trying to compete to get to third place above someone who's in Maryland or Denver. And I push it, you know, you never quite know. Poor old Andrew Marge. You remember he overdid it on the rowing machine and um, was slightly damaged for it. But um, Damn. at the moment, I'm hoping that it staves off the heart attack rather than induces it yes. and brings it on. Yes. And uh, as Alex Toussaint would say, I, I, yeah, 20 minutes to validate my greatness out of a 24-hour day. Yes. That's what we do in there. It's phenomenal. It's, it, it's absolutely motivating beyond belief. It's well, inc- I, I, I need to get one. Incredibly clever. Yeah, oh, really. I mean, now, it's now's it's not the time cheap. to buy one. It's not cheap, but, you know, yeah. you well, need to get one Well, I don't one, know. Maybe up. they are now. Yeah, I also do yoga once a week, which I can absolutely loathe because I'm the most – an inflexible person physically i might add um but i do a virtual class with a girl called kitty who's very long suffering um and i think you know one needs to improve one's core strength and try and deal with the tight hamstrings <laughs> so my uh, gosh <laughs> so you do you definitely look after yourself yeah but the thing is i balance it by trying to drink as much as possible um <laughs> as often as possible <laughs> you know i don't think that I, for me there is no greater joy in life than a long boozy lunch with you know you're you're what my wife or my friends oh 100 percent. i just think that is and and you know that you know the thing you know that f- first glass of wine mm-hmm. whether it's a whether you're treating yourself and you've got a glass of champagne at noon or that seven o'clock drink that gin and tonic or that really lovely glass of white and I have a little wine business, and so I'm sort of slightly obsessed with not wasting that glass. And you drink, and you sort of that you savor that sip. And I just think, thank God, I'm not an alcoholic that I can enjoy this. Yes. And you, you know, it's a slippery slope from being liking your long lunches to you know. My father died of what I call long lunchitis. Too many long lunches. It got him in. It got him in the end. So I know that it's there's a danger in my family that long lunchitis might hit us, but. Oh my God. Being That's half hilarious. drunk, I think, is one of the greatest feelings in the world. Mm. So I try and uh, balance my absolute love of drinking with the Peloton. <laughs> and I try and have a few days off. I remember actually my brother and I, we were standing in the, this ward of the hospital in London as my father lay unconscious, um, basically from booze although i think it was a photo finish of the organs at the end i'm not quite sure which one won out oh dear. but anyway um and we were chatting to this surgeon who actually was saying that the key thing is not to sort of binge you just keep yourself topped up <laughs> <laughs> worry about the extremes and i've sort of tried to bear that in mind but i kind of love being really sober and i just love being quite pissed so <laughs> 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 you know, it's that moment, you know, mid lunch when you've got friends and just everyone's just slightly, you know, yeah. on the edge. But Definitely. you're lively, you've still got your chat and the brain's working and you haven't kind of just fallen off on the other side of too much drink. Yes. Um, I think alcohol is one of the most wonderful inventions. I just absolutely adore it. It does. Do you think it can help with your writing sometimes as well? Does it open up absolutely the brain? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> Like <laughs> absolute disaster. I mean, I can write hungover, but it's not much fun. I struggle. I certainly cannot write if I've had a, a drink. I remember a friend of mine saying, is this where you work? Oh, you sit there, what, have a glass of red and write? And yeah, absolutely not. I have to yes. be stone cold sober, very, very clear in my mind. Mm. I write quite fast, and so I need clarity. And um, I no. so alcohol does not write, does not help writing whatsoever. <laughs> Yes. It might help create things you can write about, but yes. it doesn't help the writing of it, in my view. I think you need to write about the Peloton versus your your love of wine. There's something in that. You need to definitely write about yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. New Year's resolutions. I'll try and bring the two things together. Yeah. And how you could bring the two things together, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of your own home, what does good design mean to you? Oh, so much. I mean, 
what I think I love about what we've done here, Emily and I, is we've created various rooms, all of which feel very different. Um, we have a sort of terracotta dining room that feels quite sort of old school with lovely, beautifully lit hall lights and some old family portraits and a, a, a much brighter kitchen, quite a modern kitchen. Um, there's my library, which is a sort of lavender grey c- colour, uh, which I sort of spotted somewhere on Instagram and desperately tried to sort of copy this colour because I thought we were going to have a green room, you know, because Western was green. But I realised that actually, you know, you've got to create a colour that works with the light, the natural light. And the books really sing against the lavender grey in this room. Um, the way that you hang paintings, the way that you light them, I'm obsessed with lighting. I hate overlit rooms. I can't stand the overlit trains of GWR, which is sort of savage, sort of like you're being interrogated. Yes. Um, absolutely awful. I yeah. can't believe that someone designed those train carriages and then sat in it and went, yeah, 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 this is nice. Virgin trains were beautifully lit. Mm. Um, or Avantis is known now. GWR, they are criminals because they, they're over lighting and the way they design those <laughs> loos. Oh my God. If the soap's working right, there's no water. So you just get soap on your hands. Oh no. If, if the soap's working and the water and the dryer, it just blows all over you. So someone thinks that you've just had an accident. It's just horrific. Anyway, lighting, uh, low level, warm, you know, glow, so important. It I'd is. rather have lots of lamps than a bright light. I hate bright light. Yeah, it's like but supermarket then, you know, have, lights. It's like what Yeah, and then you can terrible. have you can have a sort of brighter light for a utility room, brighter light for a kitchen. Yes. But I have dim wherever we have ceiling lights, we have dimmers. So that you can always, you know, bring that down so you can have a moodier bathroom, a moodier kitchen. Mm-hmm. So I have so the kitchen is lit with sort of industrial style pendants over the table which can act rather like sort of candlelight, but you can have a brighter part of the kitchen. It's small. It's a small kitchen, but, you know, where, the, where, the, where we cook can be brighter and then the dining slightly darker, but then you can turn down the lights, obviously, of the, the kitchen and alter the mood for, the, for where you sit. So, yeah, and then, you know, the bedrooms are comfortable. So, yeah, design is so important to me, and we've got seagrass through a lot of the ground floor and rugs. So all of that sort of thing... Um, means uh you know tremendous amount i think that design is is everything you know you live with it you see it 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 affects the way that you feel and think so it's vital yeah it is it really kind of sets the tone and your mood and i totally agree especially on a train where you feel like you might like to relax it the lighting really needs to reflect that for sure and um what, what do you have a beautiful kitchen we have a, I think it's a beautiful kitchen. It was designed by a company called Life Kitchens. We mm-hmm. have studios in Waterloo. And I gave them this brief of um, using what was a relatively small room. And they came up with, they created a sort of semi walk in larder out of a very, very small area, which was maybe literally three foot out and about eight foot across. And they've created this area of, with a, you know, with where you can keep store food and have a little fridge and a dishwasher and another sink with a Kuka tap, which, which is amazing, instant boiling water. And then there's a sort of promontory adjacent to a small Arga with a very high butcher's block so that when I chop, I can both talk to friends who are sitting around this lovely long wooden table on a on an L-shaped bank banquette and I can cook on two hobs that are on the promontory. So there's an L shape of Arga promontory, two electric hobs with another oven, electric oven supplementing the Arga, and then this butcher's block that's big and high, so it's really nice for the back, and you can chop, you know, chop for Britain on there and to chat to your friends. I remember I had some friends who came to stay the other day. They got a bit late, so I cooked them breakfast. And then they didn't move, and I cooked them lunch. Stood there. And I quite like that. I like standing, chatting, drinking a glass of wine, talking yes. to friends who sat, sat. So it's it's a small place, but it's it's social. It's it's uh, painted in I think it's called a china blue. So it's like a bluey grey, and then it's got lovely fabric um, blinds designed by a woman called Mel Thorne who lives down here in Somerset. Um, 
So there's lots of light. And it's just off the playroom, off the nursery where my kids are, my two smallest ones, sort of hang around making a racket. And we've got this amazing um, TV above the, a little fireplace and they're framed in a mirror. So mm -hmm. when it's off, you know, you don't see it, but then it, it reveals itself, you know, through the mirror. It's very cleverly designed. Nice. My company called Frame Your TV, I think they were called. Yes. <laughs> it, was a, it was a hell of a job, but it was worth it because televisions are so ugly. Yeah. But it's so nice that actually you see this big mirror, but it's actually a telly and it's got all the stuff in it, skybox and, you know, so. It's there, but it's the not house, there. Yeah. So the house has a nice flow. It's got a nice little hall, you know, kitchen to the left. You go and you've got a drawing room and you know, dining room. So it's the, the way a house flows. And as I say, trying to create different feelings in different rooms, different atmospheres. So that it's this sort of sense of adventure. And I love it. People come into come, people come through the dining room and they come to the, my library and it's kind of, wow, you know, it's a sort of hidden little space. So, uh, yeah, I love it. It sounds gorgeous. And how did you, like, how did you find working and living um, as a family through the, the recent pandemic? How did that all work for you as a family? Well, it worked fine, to be honest. Actually, we we got locked in with my mother-in-law, who's a wonderful cook and brilliant with the kids. And um, there were a lot of, okay, I didn't go to restaurants, but there were lots of food stories, so I never stopped working. I had a, unfortunately, I had a book out. I think on the one day where every restaurant in Europe, if not the world, was shut, and it was a history of restaurants. So I, I slightly, vainly hoped that people would um, take advantage of it through, you know, living vicariously. But I don't think it really helped sales, to be honest. <laughs> the book sort of bookshops were shut, but um, I still did a bit of promoting. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we had a very happy lockdown. I went cycling every day. It was before we moved to where I'm talking to you now. Mm -hmm. We lived we lived sort of quite happily. I missed my older kids. I didn't see so much of them. Um, but uh, I think we had quite a good lockdown, to be honest. Um, we, we, you know, I launched a little wine business. So we used to have a little wine tasting every other week for the wines I'd put up on my, That's my little shop. Yes. And um, we ate well and... You know, Barney was born in um, 2020, so we had a COVID baby. Oh, wow. So, you know, I read about, I keep reading about these people who have nothing to do all day and trying to work out what to do. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I was never been so busy in my life, you know, I know. work, babies. It was, you know, every day was chaotic. Um, so, but we, you know, we all had COVID last Christmas, which was miserable. But oh, uh, we lived to tell the tale, I'm glad to say. Yeah. God, so interesting. Um, has the restaurant and food industry suffered much in the UK? Colossally, and it's being decimated once more. Yeah. Tom Carriage put a picture up on Instagram yesterday of a restaurant, one of his businesses in London, and it was a sort of two pages of A4, and beside every booking it just said cancelled. Oh, People are cancelling now, but there's no government support right now. So something's going to have to be done because – restaurants are entering their busiest phase of the year and this was supposed to be the few weeks that were going to prop up businesses that for, through no fault of their own were teetering. We've lost a lot of businesses. Lots of well-known people have lost their businesses. Gosh. Um, you know, we were getting somewhere before Omicron um, turned our lives upside down again recently. Mm. I hope that people will get boosted. I hope, we, I hope that Johnson... Uh, aversion to lockdowns persists but you know he Nicola Sturgeon tends to lay down the gauntlet politically mm -hmm. challenging him to be tougher and then he normally folds and does what she's doing but I hope he resists because yeah. we've got to keep on living and um, you know we need to have a five-year vaccine plan that's what's happened the NHS know that's that's what it is that's those are what the contracts are with people working in vaccinations they know that it's five years so yes. we need we need national, as a nation to know there's at least a five-year, first five-year plan so that um, we can live uh, normally and not be bounced into stuff and governments don't have to be taken by surprise. So yeah. anyway, but we've got a lot to learn as a nation, of course. So, of course, the government makes it up as it goes along. It has to because there's no option, other option. Yes. We don't know what, how these things work out. But, yeah. um, but uh, hospitality has been... Um, 
you know, severely disrupted. And then yes. there's this extraordinary thing where there's this job shortage for all sorts of reasons. Some some of it due to Brexit, some people going back to Europe and not coming back. Um, a, a, a whole generation of people thinking that maybe hospitality, given the fact it's so precarious because of it's being decimated, doesn't offer a great career. So they're going into different things. So when you can open, you can't get the staff. Uh, every week I hear chefs talk about, you know, how they're struggling to staff their restaurants. But then these places are, have been filling up. So it's a, it's a very strange moving picture and i sympathize with people who've got who've got these businesses yeah and is is going green and being more sustainable something you think about more often Uh, yeah absolutely i mean i certainly um i'm pretty aware of plastic and not trying to use plastic not trying i try and avoid buying plastic water bottles certainly because it's bad for you to eat drink rather uh, you can certainly, if you have analysis, the body will show plastic in the in the, in the in the bloodstream, remnants of drinking out of plastic bottles. So it's bad personally as well as environmentally. Um, I uh, we try and shop carefully. We recycle. Uh, we compost. I've been doing those things just naturally for years. Um, do I try? Do I? I don't choose to, where to eat because environmental concerns you know to be honest um but we try and live a natural life we try and grow things in the garden shop locally we just try and exist you know in a way that sort of seems to flow with the seasons and nature Mm. um but i wouldn't pretend that i have some sort of environmental you know badge on me that would be as as much bullshit as if i said i've been a foodie all my life (laughs) i know I know, but it's just the way the world's kind of going, really. And I, yeah, I'm afraid I, I do, I do uh, have an espresso machine, so I, I'd probably get <laughs> minus points for that. And I, I haven't found a way of. No, of, of, I think everyone does. I have does. a great, I have a great, I have a, a godmother in Australia who turns them into bangles or something. But um, oh, so yeah, I'm sorry, but I use an espresso machine, but I love it. Not that I can tell the difference between some of the flavors, but anyway. <laughs> and have you enjoyed working on MasterChef? Are you a tough? Yeah, very or a, much. Are you a tough judge or a kind judge? How would I'm you an describe? honest judge. I'm an yes. honest judge. Okay. You know, I uh, I say as I see, and um, um, you know, I think you've, you've got to be honest. You can only try and reflect what you see on a plate, and in the spur of the moment, hope that the words that flow out of your mouth will entertain or give some insight. Yes. So uh, that show pops up, you know, has done for, gosh, can't be best part of 20 years now. I never know if they'll ask me back. So I feel very blessed each time they do because it's a fun thing to do. And it, you know, it helps sell books because it, you know, gives you a certain kind of, uh, you know, you get put your name out there. I wouldn't yeah, say definitely. I'm sort of massively famous, but, you know, I'm not famous enough. I, I go to places and people kind of look at me and think they think they know me. <laughs> you know, Cousin get, William, yeah, you know, yeah, and you kind of get no, and you tell them no. You, you know. Yeah, that's um, funny. So uh, it's a it's a great show. It's a fantastic formula, um, and uh, every year I think it seems to get better. The professionals is a great a great uh, contest that's going on as we speak now. Um, I used to love Junior Master Chef. I thought that was wonderful. These little kids in their little Master Chef white aprons coming into the judging room with our scary grown-ups in our suits. Yeah. I thought they took great courage doing that. Absolutely. But it's a great show, and you sometimes do see great talent coming out of it. There are some good amateur chefs who've – you know, the wonderful thing is it really does go on to change people's lives. The amateurs who go into it, who then are either you know are semi-finalists or finalists – often go on to, to start restaurants, um, mm-hmm. to have careers in food, whether they're people like, you know, Drew Baker or um, Thomasina Myers, Simon Wood. There's all sorts of people who've come out of that show, both from professional and amateur. I don't think it does much for the celebs, but I don't yeah. know who any of them are anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and what do you look for? Like, what is it that you feel makes a chef stand out from the rest, in your opinion? Uh, what, on, on, just generally or on, on, on MasterChef? On MasterChef. And generally. Well, I, think some, I think someone who 
is doing something that 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 reflects a natural ability you know you have to absorb what's going on in the world and learn but you've got to be able to also uh use that experience and flex it with your own natural talent and do it in a way so that what's seen what goes on the plate you know that what what separates the boys from the men is when you see a dish that is complex complicated but also has a f- sort of feeling of naturalness to it mm-hmm. um and it's a, you know it, it's a you know there's a thin line between uh you know people ma- messing up horribly and people doing brilliantly so yeah. it's a difficult thing to quite put your finger on but um a certain amount of originality a certain amount of courage and a certain amount of common sense but also an, an, a general affinity with understanding what tastes good and what works and how, yes. what to put on the plate and what not to put on the plate and what goes with what. Um, and, you know, the talent always shines through. Of course. And and it's like a lot of pressure as well, I can imagine, for them, for the contestants. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's tough and they're of... nervous, you know. Of course, that would definitely come into play. But, of course, they'll be in a, they'll be under a lot of pressure when they're in the kitchen in the real world. Yeah, totally. But that's, you know, you don't feel sorry for the, sh- the pressure that chefs put themselves under. You know, they, they, you know they, they enter that world willingly. Yes. That's what they get off on. You know, you can't feel sorry for anyone who, you know, for politicians who have a stressful time. They've chosen to do it up to a point. Um, and likewise, chefs choose that career. So, you know, they love the stress. Yeah. And what are some of the, your favorite restaurants that you've dined in to date? Oh, there's some wonderful places around at the moment. Um, it's a great place in Somerset called Home that I went to recently, brand new, South Petherton. Great talents in there. Wonderful, wonderful place. Um, Fallow in London. A lot of good game in there. Um, gosh, I should have my top five at my fingertips. Um, there's a lot of very, very good places in uh, in this country at the moment. We're very, very, we're very blessed. There's lots of great co- cooking talent. And I think regionally, food imp- improves exponentially, you know, year after year. So we're in, yes. a, we're, we're in a very exciting place now. Definitely. And what's your favorite type of cuisine? What do you like to eat? Um, gosh, I'm quite kind of eclectic, but I suppose I love really amazing sushi. Mm-hmm. I love beautifully presented sort of kaiseki cuisine, amazing Japanese food. I've been fishing with a Japanese chef called Yoshi, Yoshi, Yoshi Ishii, who used to work at this place called Umu in London. He went, I, went, I went fishing as he taught the fishermen in wow. that not far from here, actually, how to actually kill the fish Ikejimi style, where you stick a rod down their back so it stuns them. And uh, they then they have a better death and the blood doesn't bleed into the muscles and you get better textured fish. Wow. And I've... I, so I've seen him fishing and I've watched him slice mackerel and I can't think that it's possible to prepare food uh, more perfectly than him. Wow. So that's a privilege. I love really, really great Indian food, but I love simple food. I love a great dal. I love a wet dal, rice, naan bread. Mm-hmm. But I love really lovely Italian regional cuisine that you might find as you travel through Italy. Mm. Um, so, yeah. And in all of your travels, which chef has inspired you the most and why? Oh, that's an impossible question, really. Um, I, uh, you know, I've sort of looked into the, historically, some of the great names, like Soya, you know, this amazing man who built this kitchen at the Reform Club, right in the middle of the Victorian Industrial Revolution, where he was bringing to bear gas for the first time and temperature control and he produced what was probably the most beautiful kitchen in Europe and I find people like him amazing modern day chefs you know I mean you can't beat Marco Pia White for being mad and brilliant and inspiring and funny and deranged and off the handle and unreliable (laughs) Mm -hmm. um uh, Pierre Kaufman's an incredible talent. Marcus Waring is brilliant watching him work. A very nice guy as well. Um, there's a few names for you. 
I, I mean, I think Alice Waters is someone also, I would say, is one of the most wonderful cooks in the world. You know, right. She is in Berkeley, California. She created um, Chez Panisse mm-hmm. on the back of the sort of cultural revolution and the, the sort of uh, anti-war spirit, anti-Vietnam spirit, of the late 60s, early 70s, and into this sort of atmosphere of artists and revolutionaries and filmmakers, this beautiful creature, Alice Waters, pops up and opens a restaurant serving sort of local simple food inspired by her travels to France. And she tried to connect her restaurant with farmers, tried to cut out the middlemen. She's always tried to fight big business. She's been a passionate advocate for free school meals. Um, I think if I had to sort of put my finger on one person who's probably the most inspiring, most impressive person in in food. It would probably be Alice Waters. So, so did you travel a lot of California? Um, a bit, you know, San Francisco. Yeah. L.A. Yeah. Um, Do you like America? That's about it, really. Uh, bits. I mean, I like some American people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you prefer I, the uh, east coast to the west coast or the west coast to the east coast oh, i or? don't have i don't know it well enough you know i find new york terrifying mm. you know i like to walk through a city and i'm so naive you know you'd sort of go oh, this place is on broadway and you'd still walking on this bloody street half an hour later sort of exhausted yeah um yeah it's big i'm overwhelmed by new york yes it uh, is i find big. it I find it hard to sort of deal with the fact that you know, once the sun goes behind the building, that's it for the day. Yeah. Um, I'm mesmerized by San Francisco. I think it's the most beautiful city. Yeah. Um, to sort of imagine if you buy a house and you forgot that's in the foggy bit, <laughs> you know, and you yeah. sort of live, live in mist for the whole of your life. <laughs> um, I think the food on the West Coast is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the restaurant scene on the East Coast is pretty amazing. Also. Yeah, they're totally different. Like the 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 like the restaurants, the feel, the menus. I think they're often very so. They're just different, really. You know, it's the outdoor living of the West Coast that I guess is so different. What part of the whole writing process do you love the most? Uh, the finished thing, <laughs> the published book. Yes. The byline, but then it's on to the next thing. I quite like being in the midst of it, I suppose, but it's such hard work. You know, whoever wants to be at the coalface, for God's sake, you know, <laughs> the glory of, 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 of the book, when a book yeah. comes out, it's in your hands. I mean, it's the most wonderful feeling. The idea of when you cobble a whole lot of words together and it becomes a book, and it becomes a thing. It's just yeah, amazing. It's incredible. My grandfather, Sushovel, read about 130 of them. I've done about three. My God, I admire his spirit and tenacity and timetabling and, focus um so when i'm on a roll and i'm writing something which i think is sort of vaguely amusing and interesting i i'm very absorbed and i enjoy i suppose i do enjoy it but come on i'd much rather not be not be writing and be having a glass of wine and surrounded by my books <laughs> yes and do you ever get writer's block do you ever get days like that where you're no, just kind of I, stuck? You know, how can you if you have a deadline you've got to write no that's true so the deadline no. is i mean is sometimes there might be a rest sometimes i might be a restaurant i'm struggling to get in find a way but there's nothing like a deadline to whip your ass tell you to put yourself together you know i'm not writing fiction i mean i you know i'd like to that and i can see how you get the block there but um, writer's block is, I think, just a sort of excuse for being lazy. You just got to write, you know. Yes. Unless you write a book, it won't be written. And, yes. You know, people sort of say, "Well, how do I begin?" Well, you, you know, <laughs> you don't worry about how to begin. You got to worry about how you're going to what you're going to do when you're halfway through. Yeah. You know, when you write a book, it's like sort of walking on the Scottish moors. You know, you go up a hill and you think you're going to get to the top, and then you just get over the brow, and there's another one. When you're half, when you're sort of forty thousand words in, and you know you've got another forty, that's that's the hardest part. Mm-hmm. It's just the acres, and it's just the pushing through. Physic- it's the physical bashing of the keyboard, and I give my keyboard a bashing. I I type very loudly. 
people on trains hate me if I'm writing. They sort of look at me like I'm sort of deranged. <laughs> so I sort of bash away at the keyboard like it's a sort of old fashioned typewriter. So um, because I, I physically hit the keyboard, you know, I am at a cold face. I'm, I'm hitting it. Uh, it's manual labour. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> you know, I'm using people with a look at you go, oh, God, look at your hands. What do you do? And you go, I work. My, these hands work. You know, this is manual. This is physical. <laughs> and how it's do physical. ideas, like do thoughts come to you throughout the day and then you'll like stop and make a note of them? Do you keep a record of thoughts that come to you? Well, generally, because, because I generally write, most of the time, newspaper articles, there's a sort of task and that needs doing, that gets done, then it's on to the next thing. So right now, as I'm talking to you, I'm thinking, oh, my God, we need to stop talking because I've got two deadlines. You know, so it's the panic and the fear. Yes. <laughs> um, so what I might find is I might think uh, I might think of a, an intro line, literally, you know, thinking, how do I get into this piece? You know, so I've, I'm going to write a piece about, for the yes. Telegraph, about lamington cakes in Melbourne for my travel piece. And I know that, I know the first line because it just came, you know, it comes to you and you think, right, I'm, I'm away. The first line is always, you know, then you, then you, then you, then there's no stopping. I don't draft and redraft things really. I tend to start and get to the end and the mind works. I manage to sort of conclude and reflect the beginning bit with a bit of color in the middle. And tell me about um, your morning. Tell me about your morning ritual. What is the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? Groan. Uh, Run my wife's bath, turn the lights on, draw the curtains, put on my strange Moroccan kind of robe thing. What's it called? A jab- jabala? Jab- what are yes. they called? Jab- jabala? Jabuli? Jabala? Yes. Um, and then I put my boots on if it's wet outside and a, and a jacket over it. And I take Cyrus out into the dark, misty morning, wishing there was light. Open up the hens, come back bath kids up and then we're, we're away that's so lovely i love that i'm trying to imagine you getting up to let out the hens i just think that's a lovely part of your day actually <laughs> yeah they need cleaning <laughs> do have you named them i think uh there's a few that are named i can't remember them my wife named them we just got another a batch more there's a cockerel arrived and he arrived with these new ladies and then it's funny after three days he jumped on the perch with the old ladies. <laughs> Amuse me. He's a fast worker. My goodness. And how does social media fit into your life? I absolutely hate it, but it's, ne- it's a necessity. It is. Yeah. I worry that, you know, the amount of time one wastes scrolling when you should be reading a book it makes me feel so guilty. But then also I sell things through social media. I sell wine williamshousewines.com sold through social media my supper clubs sell through social media as well as a database my pieces for the telegraph i'm encouraged to promote through social media so you know i post them on twitter that sewer of a liberal lefty thinking sort of a sort of <laughs> a kind of sewer of hate that one has to <laughs> occasionally look at instagram's rather nicer but, um, you know, this whole adage of, you know, if it's not on Instagram, it didn't exist. It's terrifying, isn't it? If you didn't film something, it didn't happen. I know. And uh, we're in a strange world, really. I read, this morning about these, I read this morning about these new Nike shoes that you can buy virtually and put them on your feet, on your social post. And you can buy them for about, they're trading for about three, four grand upwards. I mean, the world's gone mad. It has. It really but, um, has. So, yeah, I kind of use it. I, I, you know, I don't know what I, why I, I sort of, you know, cook a nice joint of beef and I put the picture on Instagram. I don't know why I do it. One just does it. But, you know, you might get engagement. <laughs> I was you just going to ask you that. You work it out. Yes. I have one last question for you. If you were having a dinner party and you could invite only three people, dead or alive, who would mm. they be? Oh, that's so hard. I'm sort of obsessed with uh, criminals and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and sort of nasty <laughs> terrorists <laughs> uh, because I just think they're more interesting. I really want to know what Saddam Hussein was thinking about how he felt betrayed by the Americans and confused. Mm. Um, 
how brave he was when he went to the gallows. Uh, whatever you think of him. I quite like, what about Gaddafi? Oh, my um, Lord. <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, I mean, Bin Laden. I mean, who wouldn't want to talk to him? You know, regardless of what you think about the morals, you know, uh, Martin McGuinness quite like to <laughs> work out what was going through his mind when he was, what was his habit of putting a nail through a soldier's palm before he inter- before he asked the first question? I think some of these characters, uh, I think, would liven up the. Uh, they the sure would. Room. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what they like to eat, though. I quite like. Well, who knows? You know, I think if you make, you know, plenty of vegetables, nice some nice meat, have a smorgasbord of things to pick at, some nice breads. Some you of know, your wine. Kind of Lebanese, it's a Lebanese feast, of wine <laughs> for those who are drinking. <laughs> you know, I think some of the world's greatest saints and, and, and most hideous sinners, you know, Gandhi, Bin Laden, Gaddafi, Hus- Saddam Hussein, and uh, some really pretty girls. <laughs> and I'm just going to do one very quick thing with you before you go. It's called the quick fire round of questions. Are you ready? Yep. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Bath or shower? Bath. Text or talk? Talk. Brussels sprouts or cauliflower? Cauliflower. Red or white wine? White. City or country living? Poof. Oh, country. Sweet or savory? Savory. Writing or broadcasting? Oh. 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 (laughs) This, broadcasting. Well, no writing. Like, that's so hard, that one. Sin or virtue? Sin. Black truffles or white truffles? Black. uh, Carrots or cabbage? (laughs) Carrots. Fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. And my final question is, Saddam Hussein or Bin Laden? <laughs> Saddam. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much well, for chatting with me today, William. You've been very interesting and I've loved uh, listening to your story. And thank you for spending the time chatting with me today. And I wish thank you, you so and your family love. a really Merry Christmas. Thank you so much. And I hope uh, you have a great 2022, as I hope we all do. Same to you.